for your Miss your favorite show? Download the podcast at kcaaradio.com. Here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here. What a day today was. Big hearing, and I'll tell you, I uh, I got to give credit to Liz Cheney. I, I'm giving credit to Liz Cheney on these hearings. I'm giving her the credit because they have been compelling. They have been on message. They have been directed. They have been focused, and they've been, well, um, well done. And and the the suspense levels, the 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 grabby in kind of things, yeah. This is this is Republican messaging. She gets it. Uh, I, I <laughs> I'm going there. Uh, she gets it. Because uh, I don't know that today, today I don't know why today was such a special bit of of information that it had to happen in this breaking kind of fashion. There's part of me, part of me that goes. I think this may have been. I don't know, planned out to you know, kind of generate some buzz, to grab some attention, but in a good way, because wow. Wow. Did I say wow? Wow. Bombshells, and lots of them. I was looking at the, the headlines of a couple of newspapers. New York Times, Trump sought to join January 6th mob. Enraged! He lunged for the limo wheel. USA Today, Trump lunged at security chief on January 6th. Politico, former White House aide, delivers shocking testimony about out-of-control Trump on January 6th. Los Angeles Times, Trump flew into rage on January 6th and lunged at Secret Service agent. Washington Post, Trump wanted crowd to march to Capitol despite weapons. Oh, yeah, there was lots of that. Lots and lots. Now, here's the thing. Everything that I've warned about over the years, everything I've talked about over the years with the the Trump administration and the Donald himself uh, was laid out during laid out right right in the open on the table during Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony. Uh, she, a true, true MAGA world believer. Understand this was she she not only drank the Kool-Aid, she was one of the people who absorbing it intravenously uh this is one of those folks that they were all in all in and to have her come forward in in this moment and go uh, no this was wrong this is a true believer realizing the cause wasn't what she was what she was led to believe it was supposed to be she thought she was fighting to change America, fight for America, make America great again. That's what she bought because she bought the T-shirt. She got the hat. She, I'm sure she had the flag. I'm sure she had the underwear. I'm sure she had it all. And this is one of those moments where as, as someone who was one of the true believing crowd, one of the, the flag waving, one of the people in the pews, you know, chanting, one of the, one of the, one of the, one of the cult. Who's come out and and said this is this is reality. This is what I saw. This is what happened. This is this is all of the unvarnished horrible. I wonder, is this the moment for MAGA World to go? Yeah, it's okay now. You know, I, I can maybe we can stop defending reflexively just how horrible Trump is. Because look, you know, all over the last four or five years, you know, well, since 2016. 2015, really, I've been saying, this guy's horrible. Uh, you know, greedy, self-centered, fascistic, petulant, childish, chaotic, reckless, megalomaniac, uh, egotistical, you know, abusive, cowardly, you know, go on, uh, anti-American. You know, reality is, I ran out of adjectives of just how bad this guy was going to be. And and it was laid out on the table today in, in, in a hearing of a true believer these weren't my words. These weren't, you know, some hippie leftists. This this weren't, this certainly was not, was not Antifa. That was not what we saw today. This was a true believer. 
and the story that, that she she laid out was one of of Donald Trump willing to throw the entire history of this country away and not just Trump and this is the this is the part that I'm struggling with and I've struggled with for a very long time. Look, I know most of the operatives in the political world when you get up to that level are soulless. I know most of the people that were, you know, lobbyists and work in DC are completely and totally soulless. They view everything that happens in the frame of it's a game. But it's also a game that has guardrails that there's only so far you're willing to go. And I think you saw that in the lawyers. Uh, Cipollone and, and Hirschman and some of the others who were saying, no, th this is the th these are the bounds of how 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 crazy and how out of, out of control we're willing to get. But the rest of them. The people who, who well, you know, and the way she laid out how her boss. You know, just kind of, yeah, well, it's going to get bad. Um, I find it fascinating that none of the none of the people around him were willing to do the right thing in the moment. Now you're going, hey, you know, there are some people, you know, Mike Pence hero now, you know, even this Cassidy Hutchinson, you know, right now doing the right thing. You know, where were these people that now understand MAGA world full bore? And I guarantee you she is getting death threats as we speak. I guarantee the the full weight and and an anger of MAGA world on her, especially since Trump has done what Trump does and and began to attack her. Uh, you know, who knew uh, nobody knew her. His, his statement uh, was I hardly knew this person, Cassidy Hutchinson. Uh, is uh, other than I heard very negative things about her, heard very negative things. Total phony a leaker. And when she requested to go with certain others on the team to Florida after having served on my full term uh, in office, I personally turned down her request. Uh, he goes on to say, uh, uh, why did she want to go with us if she felt so terrible? I understand that she was very upset, very angry, but I didn't want her to go or to be a member of everything. She's bad news. Bad news. Um, <laughs> this is what he put on. So this is what he does. I barely knew her. But the pictures, and this is where you know the, the committee did a very good job putting up the pictures of, hey, there's the orange menace. There he is right there. And oh, there she is over there. And there he is again, and there she is, and there he is, and there she is. Huh, barely knew her, huh? Now, uh, my mindset goes into this world. She's a young woman. Um, easy for him to dismiss her. So maybe he thought she was just the help. I, 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 don't, I don't know. Um, but interesting that this would be the defense and, and it is what it is the MO, is it not? This is what Trump does. Anyone who is disloyal or tells the truth, they get attacked. Also, what I found interesting is as the hearing wrapped up, you had Liz Cheney come out and say, look, you know, a lot of the witnesses are getting, you know, what, what you knew, you knew. Look, you, you know that Trump views himself as kind of a mafia don, as kind of the, you know, the, the head of the family, kind of the, you know, the Vito Corleone character. So is it surprising that witnesses are getting the phone calls or the messages of, hey, you know, uh, it's a mighty nice career you got there. It'd be a shame if something happened to it. You know, it's nice, uh, you know, it's a nice thing you got there. And as long as you do the right thing, as long as you stay, uh, stay where you're supposed to, as long as you don't open your mouth, you're going to be fine. You'd be fine with MAGA world. Now you step out of line, we're going to sick the crazies on you. And I got to imagine uh, she's taking her, her beatings right now figuratively, figuratively. Now, this is, this is, again, I look at that administration and there are so many scandals that would take down any other presidency. But it's almost, like I said, it's almost a cult where I know people who, even in the face of this woman who has truly drank the Kool-Aid, who has come forward and said, these are all the horrible things that happened, they're still never going to believe it. Never. Because they're, they're somehow they're vested in it. And I'm not sure how that happens. 
I have never been never been that invested in any politician ever, ever. <laughs> if this were any any president, I. I would be first in line to say lock them up because this was truly criminal. Truly. Now, one of the things that we found out, and this is this is one of those questions that I go back to January 6th. We came on the air here that night and I said, you know what I don't understand? is how is it that the people in the crowd were able to have flagpoles that were metal with the little the, the eagles on that they used as, as weapons, as spears? How are they able to have all of these, these things that they, they had? We found out from her testimony that a bunch of people didn't go through the metal detectors to get into the area around where Trump was, which explains why that wasn't full. Because they had the, you know, the, 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 the checkpoint set up with the magnetometers that you had to go through the metal detectors. Um, and people were, you know, no, we're not going to go through that. We'll stand just outside because we know ultimately we're marching to the Capitol and we need to have our weaponry, in which we now know, um, yeah, they had bear spray and they had knives and they had AR-15s and people were packing heat. In fact, they played some some audio from Capitol Police pointing out, hey, that, that guy's got an AR-15. Hey, that person's got a gun. Hey, that person's got a weapon. They actually were picking people out of the crowd who were armed. So much for, oh, no, it was just like any other day. It was, a, it was just like just a lobbying day. It was a good American patriotic day. They were between the velvet ropes. Granted, they were defecating on the floor and urinating on desks and, and breaking windows and all that stuff and, and stabbing policemen with, with flagpoles. But any other day. I mean, <laughs> and then you find out that the Trump was like, hey, I don't care that they had weapons. I don't care that they're armed. I don't care because they're not coming for me. They're my people. They're not here for me. So I don't care. Get rid of the metal detectors. And you go, but but what about the Capitol Police? What about the people in the Capitol? And if you're a Republican legislator, this is the this is the this is the part where I have mentally played this game out. I don't care what what letter you have behind your name. If somebody in that crowd grabbed somebody with a congressional pin, if they would have kicked in a door and found a congressman in their office or a congresswoman in their office, I have no doubt they would have ripped them limb from limb. Republican or Democrat or independent, it didn't matter. That crowd was out for blood. And he riled them up. And she talked about how the, the, the legal counsel office was saying, hey, don't say these things. Don't don't rile these people. Don't do this. Don't do what you did. Don't put this stuff in the speech. They did it anyway. They did it on purpose. I also found it interesting that, uh, again, my congressman's name, Scott Perry, was brought up as someone full right in the middle of all of this stuff. Found it interesting that uh, General Flynn's name was brought up and, and him pleading the fifth again. You know, I love uh, you know, how Trump said, you know, anybody who pleads the fifth, you know, they must be guilty, <laughs> except all the people around him who have been doing nothing but pleading the fifth. There's so much here. And it's going to get it's going to get more. It's going to get worse. It's going to get bigger. I, they're, they're, I believe that this is going to the next step is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the question is, is, is Merrick Garland watching this? I think that's what's on everyone's mind, because I'll tell you, I, as today was going on, my mind was, hey, when's someone going to call for an indictment? When they were talking about, hey, uh, you know, there are people strong arming witnesses. My, my mind goes, uh, this is probably Giuliani. They're going to say, hey, Giuliani should be indicted. So I'm curious what your thoughts. Did you watch? Did you see the, the big hearing? 1-866-416-RICK, 1-866-416-7425. If you want to weigh in, got a thought, question, comment. Uh, does it matter? Does it matter at this point? 
Uh, or is it? Or is this just every time they they they, they hit that gavel? It gets worse and it gets worse and the picture gets clearer and clearer that they absolutely wanted to overthrow our democracy. They absolutely wanted to overthrow our elections and hold on to power at any cost. one 416 rick back after this. If you're a fan of the show, you've heard our Labor History in Two segments. And you can hear them on the radio pretty much anywhere in the U.S. Labor history has never been more important than it is right now. So here's what we'd like you to do. Tell a teacher. Tell a teacher that labor history is important and that they can get digestible two-minute lessons that are absolutely free. Free to download, free to use, free to share. Tell a teacher to go to thericksmithshow.com backslash history and help us put labor back where it belongs in the classroom. You know, generations of American workers fought, bled, and died to build the American way of life. It's our job to keep their stories alive. Go tell a teacher that we're here to help them do just that. Find us at thericksmithshow.com backslash history today. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So we found out that Trump attacked a Secret Service agent. And, and look, I'm waiting for the right wing to go, the Secret Service held the president hostage. They wouldn't let him go to the Capitol. He wanted to go. He wanted to be there with his people and lead the charge. I'm waiting for the MAGA heads to do that. See, they, they stopped destiny. They stopped our destiny. Our fearless leader was going to lead us into the Capitol and hang Nancy Pelosi. I'm waiting for the crazy right wing to say that. But I'm a little surprised. I'm a little surprised that he did attack a Secret Service agent. Uh, but again, like a petulant child in a cereal aisle whose mother told him, no, you can't have the cocoa pebble. Uh, he, he done doth lost his mind. Uh, anyway, let's go to the phone. has got Alice on one. Alice, how are we doing today? Oh, we're doing. Uh, yeah, we, we watched the hearing, of course, and I'm thinking the whole time, so tell me something I do not know. You know, when she's explaining, you know, all about the explosive temper and, you know, the whole sh- shenanigans. And I'm thinking, anybody with a brain that has paid attention to this man over the past 40 years no, knows. That you know, he is nothing more than a freaking spoiled child. He is a sociopath, and y'all surprised? No, it's just a, not even a little bit. Amazing. Not even a little bit surprised that he would throw dishes against the wall or, or rip the tablecloth off tables and and make the staff clean up the mess. I, am I surprised that he abuses workers at every turn? No, not even a little bit. Well, absolutely not. I mean. You know, I remember when he was married to Ivana <laughs> and how he treated her. And it's like these people were just like, you know, it's all fake news. Uh, well, you know, I know that you all lie about Hillary and you've lied about Hillary for 40 years. But this is a lot of people long before he was involved in politics that have talked about it. It's just amazing. And I'm like you. I'm waiting for the right wing to claim, you know, oh, my, they held him hostage. But, yeah, it's just crazy. Yeah. Do you think do you think any indictments come out of this? Do you think eventually he's held accountable or is this all just performative? I'm going to tell you what I think that should and should they decide to hold him accountable that somehow or the other it will end up in front of the Supreme Court, and you know the whack job bunch of, of the conservatives are all going to be going that, you know, um, he had the right to do it because Jesus anointed him or some, <laughs> you know, some stupid thing. I mean, seriously. Yeah, yeah, think yeah, about it. <laughs> all right, Alice. Thank you for that. I got a laugh out of it. Have a good evening. Thank you. And the, but here's the thing, and this is where one of those moments where you go, our 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 institutions held barely, barely. We're, we've held on for now, barely. 
And this was the conversation I had with my daughter because we were in the car watching. Uh, we were watching this as we were driving. And I was listening. She was watching. And, you know, this is one of those 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 moments where, you know, as it was going on, we're having this conversation going. This is something that you're you're probably going to be telling your grandchildren about. This is this is that kind of historical moment, because at one point she turned to me and she goes. Did the president really want the vice president to be hung? Is that what she just said? And I said, yeah, <laughs> that's what she just said. So you may want to remember that because, you know, generations down the road are going to remember this is good. This is going to be the history that is taught in 100 years. Yeah, there was a president was a long time. He was an orange guy, uh, petulant, used to throw dishes against the wall, you know, used to do all kinds of weird stuff, temper tantrums, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and yeah, he wanted to hang his vice president. Yeah, that's going to be like a trivial pursuit question in 100 years. If, and this is the big if, and this is what I told her, this is the big if, because we are at a crossroads. Do we head down the authoritarian, fascistic kind of road that, that someone like Trump, that someone like Josh Hawley, that someone in Pennsylvania like Benito Mastriano would take us down, where you have a theocratic corporate governance? Or do we continue down the path of, well, of liberal democracy? You know, we're in a moment much, and this is what conservatives understand. They understand the gravity of this moment. They're seeing this much the way the New Deal 90 years ago. You know, in, in 32, when, when FDR won and you had a massive movement towards more social programs, more worker-centric stuff, more, more working-class-centric policy, they hated that. Uh, they hated Social Security. They hated unemployment insurance. They hated maximum hour laws. They hated minimum wage laws. They hated unionization rights. They, they hated all of it hated it and have been fighting against it all of these years. And we are now at a moment where they're they're about to kill off the New Deal. They're about to kill off the 20th century and take us back to the good old days of the 19th. This is where working people, women, minorities, this is where all of the folks on the left had better put down their divisions, put down their cause head mentality and join together and understand what the real fight is. The real fight is saving our democracy. Because the theocrats are coming. And I just saw this clip of, of Lauren Boebert. And this is what happens when you have the dumbest person in the class representing you in Congress. Uh, she was given a spiel at some religious group thing. And she says, I'm tired of this separation of church and state junk. That's not in the Constitution. It was in a stinking letter, and it means nothing like what they say it does. She believes, she believes that the church, the church directs government. The church tells government what to do. That the, the religious folk, her, tells everybody else what they have to do. This is what she believes. Now, again, you know, the stinking letter. <laughs> uh, she didn't read doesn't matter to her because she's a believer and I'm telling you these people are dangerous because they're not smart enough to realize the path that they're taking all of us down love to hear your thoughts email me rick at the rick if you miss any portion of the program podcast make sure you get that and take a quick break right back after this stick around and listen to the rick smith show I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1940. That was the day President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the Smith Act. Some initially dubbed it the Harry Bridges Law after the radical labor leader, long targeted by the FBI for deportation. Politicians claimed it was designed to prosecute fascists, Nazis, and communists. In fact, the Smith Act was first used to prosecute and convict Minneapolis Teamster leaders and supporters of the Socialist Workers Party recognized for their successful 1934 strike and radical leadership. Named after the Virginia Democratic Representative Howard W. Smith, it was originally titled 
titled the Alien Registration Act of 1940. In addition to mandating the registration and fingerprinting of resident aliens, it allowed for the deportation of those resident aliens who sought to overthrow the government by force. But the act also extended to those citizens who advocated the overthrow of the government by force or violence or engaged in the printing, publishing, or distributing of materials that advocated sedition. And it made it illegal for citizens to organize or belong to any association that engaged in such activity. According to historian Donna Haverty Stack, author of Trotskyists on Trial, Free Speech and Political Persecution Since the Age of FDR, the Smith Act was a peacetime anti-sedition law that marked a dramatic shift in the legal definition of free speech protection in America. The Minneapolis case shows how far the administration went to prosecute political dissent, even to the point of targeting the labor liberal left. The Smith Act served as a prime tool for the McCarthyite Red Scare, and it was used to prosecute more than 100 communists and labor leaders. Finally, in a landmark 1957 Supreme Court case, Yates v. United States, convictions under the Smith Act were rendered unconstitutional. Too many big business CEOs turn out to be grifters, ripping off consumers, workers, and others. But the corporate con artists I consider most vile are those who profiteer on people's health care needs. We've had such infamous high-profile scammers as Medicare fraudster Rick Scott, Big Pharma price gouger Martin Shkreli, and the Sackler family of opioid pushers. Worse, though, we now face an industry-wide epidemic of insurers, hospitals, and others that are pushing higher costs onto patients, then systematically pushing those who can't pay the full inflated tab into debt schemes. With bloated interest charges, payments go on for years, and medical bankruptcies are soaring. The most significant statistic in today's avaricious world of health care finance is this. Half of U.S. adults don't have the money to cover a $500 medical bill. Thus, as the system keeps jacking up its prices and profits, millions of families are forced by illness or injury into the dark valley of debt, inhabited by ruthless debt collectors employed by the medical establishment. But wait, you say, I have health insurance. Still, ever-increasing prices and out-of-pocket insurance requirements push you into debt, too. A recent Kaiser Family Foundation survey found that 6 out of 10 working-class adults with health coverage went into medical debt in the past five years. Most perversely, health care debt prevents many people from getting health care. One in seven Americans say the corporate system has refused care to them because they have unpaid medical bills, and two-thirds say they've put off care because of the fear of crushing debt. As one expert puts it, the number one reason and the number two and three and four reasons that people go into medical debt is that they don't have the money. It's not complicated. This is Jim Hightower saying, to help stop healthcare industry's profiteers, go to ripmedicaldebt.org. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So, again, big, big explosive day of testimony with the January 6th commission. And if you didn't see it, uh, you got to you got to spend a little you got to spend the time and put the time in and watch this. Put down the uh, the mindless mind numbing TV and watch. It It was riveting Uh, throughout the it it kept my 13 year old daughter's interest Uh, that that. That kind of important. Uh, it's just so many questions to come forth with this. And here to share some thoughts on the big hearing and all of that, I've asked our good friend Trigby Olson to come talk with us. Uh, Trigby is the principal over at Viking Strategies, also a senior advisor to the Lincoln Project. Trigby, thanks for taking time for us. Hey, Rick. It's great to be back. I always enjoy talking. So let's jump into the big hearing. Were you surprised that this breaking hearing happened? Do you think this really was a breaking hearing? Do you think it was planned? Give me your thoughts. Well, I will tell you, I I watched it, um, and it was riveting um, on on many levels. And I I took a little grief on Twitter because I, I suggested that she was brave and a hero, and there were some people giving blowback on that but um you know uh, uh, she's 25 years old and um at the center of literally 
every newspaper and television station, not only across the United States, but around the world, describing what transpired and what she knew. And, um, you know, flat out crazy that, that she demonstrated so much bravery and some of these people who far more experienced, far older individuals, um, you know, cowards, have been cowering in fear and, and appeasing. Um, that's the part that struck me as, as um, stunning. And, you know, you mentioned about your 13-year-old daughter. I have a 13-year-old daughter, too. I hope I raise my daughter to be, to be her. Um, so yeah, I mean, impressive and shocking. Not that maybe we're surprised that that she was showing what Donald Trump was trying to do, but I don't know how you just you describe that as anything other than sedition by these people. No, no, and this is where you know I said, look, you know, in this moment she was, she's, she's courageous. You give her the credit for it, but at the at the moment when all this stuff is going on, I, I hesitate to throw the hero word around, uh, especially when you're talking about someone like Mike, Mike Pence. Uh, and others, you know, look, you you had opportunities all along the road to set this straight, to, to, to not allow it to get this far down the road. And none of these people, none of them, none of them did a damn thing uh, to stand up and do what's right. Now, look, I know D.C. is mostly soulless and I know most of these people are soulless and they think it's just a game. But at some point, you got to look at a scenario and go, we're going we're going off the off the cliff in a in a, in a fiery dumpster. Yeah, I mean, I think I think Mike Pence, um, Cephalo, uh, a lot of these other people who you know they're middle-aged people, and and they they have sat quiet. I don't think anyone could describe them as heroic, yeah. um, because quite frankly, you know, when you reach a certain age, you should know better. Um, I think the fact that it took somebody who's 25 to be the the one who stood up and said. I'm not going to be afraid to go and speak. Um, you know, that, that it's impressive, no doubt. I think the, you know, the reality is, and I talk about this a lot on Twitter and, and to audiences, um, you know, it's these people who appease, who enable, it's part of the reason why I decided to join the Lincoln Project. I did not know how I would be able to look my daughters in the eye when Trump came on the scene, um, if I didn't try and, and, and push back against that. And these people who've appeased, who've enabled, I mean, somebody like Kevin McCarthy, um, what weak, soulless individuals. And I just wonder how someday when they're asked by their kids, did you do the right thing? Um, they're, they're ever going to be able to look them in the eye. I, d I just don't, you know, um, yeah, it's, it, it was stunning. I don't think anybody's probably surprised about, you know, Trump and throwing China around and grabbing secrets or it's just who the guy is. Um, but the fact that all these people went along with him, um, and, and have continued to, you know, cower in silence, um, it's tragic, yeah, and it turns they out need the, to be held accountable. Yeah, it turns and out the very best that people today. are cowards. That's what it turns out. Yeah, to. yeah, and and you know, I think about about you know, uh, you know, those people take an oath um, when when they take those jobs, and um, the oath is to the United States and the Constitution, and the idea that. Um, you know, that it took somebody who, uh, you know, I remember being 25. I thought I was pretty old when I was 25, but you're really still a child um, or young, a young person to, to speak out that clearly. I thought the committee, you know, Benny Thompson, Liz Cheney, all those people on the committee, again, you know, they are, they are showing the best of what America is supposed to be about, which is average Americans standing up just like Eugene Goodman at the Capitol steering that mob away. But that, that what we learned today about how Donald Trump saw that mob, he saw them as, as basically an army to, to undermine the, the election and the American, the American system of democracy. Yep. No, and, and he didn't care what, what they did or what they had or what they were going to do because he believed they, they weren't there for him. 
So he didn't care about anybody else. And, and again, that plays into who he's always been. It's all about yes. it's always all about him. Now, I know you're in Wisconsin and there's a senatorial race going on there. Mm -hmm. um, you, Ron Johnson's eyeball deep in all of this because uh, you know, there were fake electors, I guess. The, 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 the slates came to him somehow to pass on the Pence. He didn't know about him. Then he did know about him. Then he drug you know, <laughs> Congressman Kelly into it. And, and mm -hmm. where where are things now? How? How, how how deep have the lies gotten with Ron Johnson at this point? Well, I mean, I think I think that the lies have gotten deep with Ron Johnson. What what's happening now is some truths are coming out, and he can't he can't continue to talk and explain them away. I will say, you know, Ron Johnson has has lived a little bit of a charm political life because every year that he's been on the ballot. Um, have been Republican years and in Wisconsin, and he has benefited from being able to say one thing to the base of the Republican Party and something different to in his advertising to suburban women in places like Waukesha County, where he tries to be sort of seen as more moderate. And because it's been Republican years, he's gotten through. The assumption and, and the only thing that maybe is keeping Ron Johnson afloat right now, and there was just a poll that came out from Marquette University, gold standard of Wisconsin polls, that showed um, Johnson losing by a couple points to all the Democrat candidates except for one and to a generic Democrat. None of them were over 50 percent. Um, but Ron Johnson was being held up by the fact that Republicans are much more enthusiastic about voting than Democrats. And, and the reality is Democrats in Wisconsin, independents in Wisconsin, who universally, not universally, universally in the case of Democrats and a majority of independents who loathe Ron Johnson, they have to get out and show up and vote. And if they do, Ron Johnson will be gone. Now, how is it possible Democrats are not enthused and ready to vote this November? How is that possible, given everything we've seen in these hearings uh, given the fact that that the Supreme Court just overturned Roe, that they've come out with some really horrible decisions, how is it possible that people aren't just chomping at the bit, ready to hold this cowardice Republican Party accountable? How is that possible, Trigvi? You know, it's hard for me to understand. I, I do think there's been some indications of late um, that between the 1-6 hearings and certainly you know, it's pretty early with Roe, but you had the leak that Democrats are starting to to energize more. Um, but I also think that, you know, uh, there's been a part of the of the of the Democrat coalition um, that, you know, they're fighting amongst themselves some rather than focusing on what the real enemy sometimes is. Now, there's been there's been examples where that isn't the case. But, you know, even in terms of primary turnout, we're seeing um, that Republican turnout is a lot greater than Democrat turnout. And and we'll see if that continues post row. But certainly in a state like Wisconsin, um, I can't imagine that there wouldn't be more energy on the Democrat side, given you have Ron Johnson there, and then you, and then you have a you know a bunch of Republican candidates for governor yeah. against Evers, not the most exciting guy, but a good guy, you know, a high school teacher by originally, um, and um, all all those candidates are denying the result in 2020. So if 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 that doesn't get Wisconsin Democrats revved up, I don't know quite wow. what will hopefully they will yeah it's crazy you're listening to the rick smith show here with trig v olson principal at viking strategy also a senior advisor to the lincoln project uh, you want to check out the work that they do project lincoln.org the website we'll get links out on the we website how you can check out the work they do there um you know i'm looking at this moment and, and we talked about this a moment off air i'm looking at this potentially and this is the conversation my 13 year old daughter and i had today that you know we're at kind of i think like a 1932 moment where the, the, the direction of this country for the next you know 90 years could be being set right now. And if we don't make good decisions, if we don't fight, if people don't get out and vote, if you inculcate a bunch of the crazy right-wing zealotry into law, um, it's going to be decades before you undo the damage. I'm curious if you see this moment kind of in the same frame. Oh, no doubt. 
no doubt. I mean, between now, I, I say this all the time, you know, the day we have to all be thinking about is January 20th, 2025, the day we have to inaugurate a new president. And everything between now and then um, that matters has to be the focus. And so when you think about, um, you know, when you think about the changes that are being pushed, if you're really angry about that, then that starts with, you know, governor's races in Pennsylvania, where you have Josh Shapiro running against Doug Mastriano, who, who basically wants to eliminate choice, any choice in the state of Pennsylvania, and has said that he doesn't really care how Pennsylvania votes in a presidential election. Then you go to Michigan, you got Gretchen Whitmer running for governor, against a guy, the front runner on the Republican side, became the front runner when he got arrested by the FBI for being part of one six. Again, one who wants to eliminate all choice in Michigan in terms of women's reproductive rights and simultaneously denies the election. And then you go to Wisconsin, where you have not only the same dynamic at play between the two leading candidates, but both of them are now starting to go after you know same-sex marriage and that decision. So, you know, at this point, uh, it isn't about policy differences that any of us may have. You and I may have some differences on policy, Rick, but we're in the same place that democracy, we're, we are at an essential tipping point for democracy, and, and we're not going to be out of it after 2022 either, after that election. We, we have to just make sure we get through this election protecting those guardrails of democracy. Yeah, no, I, you're absolutely right. And this is the... <laughs> You know, and, and this is the thing that, that bothers me. Uh, while we're so divided here at home, uh, globally, the world is is going in, in ways of chaos. And the more divided we are here, the less able we are to act. And I know a lot of people don't think we should be involved in international affairs or be the world's policeman. But somebody's got to be the leader of the world. Someone's got to direct things. And I would rather it be us than the Chinese or the Russians. So while we're we're you know we for four years we did nothing and the Chinese filled that void, uh, and now you've got this very dangerous and a very uncertain world, and here at home we're not doing ourselves or the globe the globe any any favors either. Yeah, I mean as you know, Rick, and maybe some of your listeners don't. I spent a lot of time in that world working with with people from the Democrat side and the Republican side working together in a lot of these countries, including Ukraine, Russia, Belarus, um, with people who are fighting against people like Putin and Lukashenko and for democracy in places like Ukraine. And it was bipartisan, both sides. In fact, my organization was led by John McCain and, and the Democrats who I work closely with was led by Madeleine Albright. I will tell you, the thing about Vladimir Putin, if you saw the video of the shopping mall being hit, um, by the cruise missile. And, and if you think about for a minute that if he could, he would be hitting the shopping mall in your country, in your hometown with a cruise missile if you don't do what he wants. And so the leadership Joe Biden has shown um, throughout this and the unification, how, how sometimes he's led from in front, sometimes he's led our allies lead, that's really leadership. And you saw it today with huge breaking news this evening that, that Turkey has lifted their veto of Finland and Sweden joining the alliance. And that's that's a real game changer. I mean, Sweden's been neutral forever, right? Um, and the Finns, they're tough as nails. Um, but there again, that's what happens when you have leadership. What happens when you have Donald Trump and, and not serious and nothing could be less serious than electing Donald Trump president of the United States. When you have political instability in the United States, you get global instability. Yeah, but you, because, but the argument, Trigby, is, well, you know, Putin didn't invade uh, Ukraine when, when Donald Trump was strong and, and in leadership position. You know, he didn't dare on Trump's watch. Yeah, I mean, but in reality, he didn't during Trump's watch because he was getting everything he wanted during Trump's watch. And quite frankly, I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting in the in the one six committee 
is is the documentary filmmaker and some of the stuff that's come out that he was he didn't get to film Trump because Trump was apparently having some call from Air Force One right before January 6th uh, with Putin. Uh, you know, I just think I just think Donald Trump's transactional and he wouldn't have any problem thinking, all right, well, I'll just sell off a piece of Europe for for you know whatever I'm going to get from Putin. Um, no, that's... So the, this idea that it didn't happen on uh, on Trump's watch, you know, it's choices and actions have consequences that are sometimes not seen immediately, and and that's what we're seeing here. Um, there was no check, um, at least not as much as there needed to be, on on Putin during the Trump years, um, and and now now we're having the, the residual consequences. Yeah, and, and, and not good. Not good at all. No. Uh, all, all bad stuff. But Trig Trigby, I appreciate the thoughts and the comments. Uh, good luck. I know you've got family tra traveling to that region of the world. I wish them the best. Um, yeah, thank you. And I'm hoping that uh, something, something in that, that, that region of the world breaks. Well, I'll tell you, Rick, the first thing that we can do in terms of helping that part of the world is is staying strong with nato and the other piece is we can get our own house in order and that's what we have to think about every day between now and and election day not just this one but in 2024 as well amen trigby i appreciate the time man thanks so much yeah thank you uh and he's right spot on accurate the get our house in order that is the number one thing we need to be doing and, and that means make sure you're registered to vote make sure you're committed to voting make sure you're ready to vote and, and get excited uh, we need to hold people accountable. I take a quick break. When we come back, lots to get to. Remember, if you miss any of the program, download the podcast. Never miss a moment. Always there, always available. Quick break. Right back. Stick around. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1936. That was the day that the U.S. Congress passed the Walsh-Healy Public Contracts Act. The bill had been proposed by the Secretary of Labor, Francis Perkins. The act was part of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal effort to combat the ravages of the Great Depression. The year before, the President and Secretary Perkins had faced a major setback in their New Deal policies. The Supreme Court had declared the National Industrial Recovery Act part of the recovery plan unconstitutional. KCAA Loma Linda, 1050 AM.